Hello students, I welcome you to another lecture on design of reinforced concrete structures. Today's topic is going to be flanged beams. And in this topic, we are going to study uh, what are the types of flanged sections, uh, how the code defines the effective width of flange, and what are the codal conditions for under reinforced and balanced sections as well. So let's get started. So in the flanged beams, Basically, we will have two types of sections, a T section and an L section. Okay, geometry wise, a T section would look uh, exactly like a T. And I will explain what these projections are. And an L section normally looks like an inverted L. Because in most cases, the slab is on the top of the beam. Okay, so this is the geometry of a T-section and an L-section. Now what happens in, uh, in case of a, a regular beam, a rectangular section, which is subjected to bending, if this is considered to be the neutral axis, then the beam portion above it if this is a simply supported case is under compression and uh, here are the reinforcing bars and this is under tension all right now you notice that the area of the uh, section area under compression is shown by the hatched portion now if you would consider uh, a section which looks like this and this is again subjected to bending and again if we draw the neutral axis for such a section let's just assume the neutral axis passes from some point in the web then you would agree that this portion which itself looks in the shape of a T is under compression and the steel that is placed in the bottom is subjected to tension T so what needs to be observed here is the area here has increased which is under compression because we know basically the moment of resistance of a section is the product of compressive force into liver arm. So if we say this is the compressive force C and this is the tensile force T and the liver arm is Z. Here if the force is C dash and uh, let's say T dash and Z so definitely for C dash the moment of resistance will be higher as compared to that of the regular rectangular section okay so one important point if you observe in all of this is the flange this is called the flange and this is called the web all right the flange must be in compression for advantage for advantage right what is the advantage the increase in area is the advantage this is the primary cause why we are uh, discussing the flanged action you have an enhanced area in compression uh, that is contributing to an increased value of compression force and then which in effect increases the moment of resistance of the entire section all right now once the flange is in the tension zone let us just take an example of a member. Uh, now, if this beam is supported on columns, let's say there, there is a fixed condition imposed at these two ends. And if I were to draw for this beam, the bending moment diagram, it would look something like this. So at these zones towards the support, the member would be under 
hogging moments which means the top portion will be under tension and the bottom is under compression so when the top when the tension occurs in the top portion the flange portion is under tension and we ignore the strength of concrete in the tension zone so in that condition the increased area because of the flange is rendered ineffective so therefore whenever the head of the t section or whenever the flange of the uh, section uh, of the beam happens to be in a tension zone then we cannot make use of the advantage of an increased area on it so that must be borne in mind that's a very important point next now the problem when you have a very wide flanged uh, beam and where do these beams occur these are cl classic example is if you have a slab and uh, let's just say the slab is discontinuous here it has continuity on either sides so if you look at this portion somewhere from here till here this whole section resembles a T to what width on either sides of the web this is the beam web to what width on either sides of the beam web should I consider as part of this beam so that this whole member behaves as a T beam alright so the bending is in this direction this is the longitudinal direction in which the beam bends and it is the uh, this flange becomes an integral portion of the beam and the bending is uh, in the longitudinal direction so the question arises what depth should what width should I be considering okay so the code gives us some empirical equations but before that we have to understand that uh, somewhere here if I am to assume the neutral axis passing from here we know this upper portion is going to be under compression which means it is subjected to compressive flexural stresses now the distribution of stresses across the width of this flange portion is not uniform in the sense as you move towards the center of the web you observe that uh, the, com the compressive stresses increase in magnitude and they uh, reduce in magnitude as you move away from the web all right now this is an entire block of stress that i am showing here and this entire block is in a parabolic form having maximum compressive stress at the center of the web and moving away from the web center and the magnitude of stress is reduced okay but in the theory of flexure as per the theory of flexure the flexural stresses which are given by m y upon i they are constant along the width of the section the flexural stresses vary across the depth of the section but they are assumed to be constant across the width of the section so therefore we have a problem here so what is done is this uh, stress distribution which is actually parabolic so this maximum value of the stress is taken sigma max and with that ordinate a reduced portion is considered right so this is the uniform stress that is assumed the magnitude of the uniform stress is equal to the maximum this is sigma max of the original uh, thing and also this will become a block a stress block having stresses in every part all right and they are all projecting here now another important term is uh, there will be a resultant force here c the real stress distribution and this is the idealized stress distribution okay so once we arrive at an idealized stress distribution the outer boundaries of this idealized stress distribution define the value of effective width of flange so the effective width of flange is basically defined as a hypothetical flange which is subjected to in plane compressive stresses which are uniform in magnitude and whose magnitude is equal to the maximum in plane compressive stress in the actual stress distribution on the original flange okay so that is the definition of effective width of flange now the code 
gives us some standard uh, equations of, for calculating the effective width of flange. Let us see what they are. So the effective width of flange is given as L0 by 6 plus BW plus uh, 6DF and uh, this cannot be greater than S1 plus S2 by 2 and this condition is for a T section and this is equal to L0 by 12 plus BW plus thrice DF but not greater than BW plus S1 by 2 and this is for an L section. Now I have to draw what these terms essentially mean. So this is an edge beam. This is an intermediate beam. This is another intermediate beam and the beam goes continuous on this side. So this distance is S1 and this center to center distance is S2 and this moves on. Okay, So this is S1 by 2, this is also S1 by 2, this is S2 by and these widths are BW, BW, the width of the web. Okay, so uh, we know what BW is, it's the width of the web, and DF is the depth of the slab or the thickness of the flange. They mean the same thing. Okay, so for a T beam which is continuous, uh, this is the formula to calculate the effective width of flange where. Okay, I will tell what L0 is subsequently, but we also have another equation. Bf is equal to L0 by L0 by uh, B W plus 4 plus B W. And this whole value should be less than or equal to B. This is again which is the flange. L0 by 2 whole divided by L0 by B plus 4 plus width of the web and this should again be less than or equal to B. This is the equation for an isolated T e beam and this is one for an isolated L beam. Okay. So these are the equations for isolated L beams and uh, T beams. Okay, now where? Let me uh, specify what each term means. For isolated beam and for uh, isolated L and T beam, this is the actual width of flange, which essentially means isolated beam will look like this so this distance is the actual width of the flange but the width effective width of the flange will be a reduced portion of this the code says whatever bf comes out to be it cannot be more than b so those are these conditions okay in, in all of these every every term has been explained except the term l0 so let's see what l0 means l0 is distance between points of zero moments along beam okay that is l0 for simply supported beam l0 is equal to the length itself in this case it is effective length which is clear span plus d or center to center of supports whichever is lesser for continuous uh, beams code says to take l0 is equal to 
0.7 into effective span okay so this is how you calculate l naught in the case of continuous beams now effective span is mentioned in the code under clause number 22.2 .2 in great detail for simply supported members beams and slabs for continuous beams and slabs for cantilevers and for frames so uh, in case of continuous members uh, one has to decide based on the width of the support is it less than or greater than one twelfth of the clear span and then check whether it is an end span or a continuous span and there are the host of conditions if you refer clause 22.2 uh, i think it is on pages 34 and 35 of the code you would get a clear idea as to how to calculate effective span so that's how you get l naught and uh, once you get l naught the effective width of flange can be computed easily there is another uh, important point which is the transverse steel requirement now let's see what this essentially means now this is basically the slab and this is the beam and the beam reinforcement will run all the way up into the slab because the depth of the beam includes the slab thickness so this is the reinforcement stirrup going around the main bars now in order for the slab to act as an integral part of the beam there must be transverse reinforcement running at the top location this reinforcement is called transverse reinforcement all right this is the transverse steel reinforcement minimum uh, steel condition there the same condition applies as has been mentioned for rectangular sections so we know ast uh, minimum ast by bd is equal to 0.85 upon fy the only difference in this equation is for flange sections b will be taken as width of flange so therefore the equation translates to ast divided by b w b suffix w into d is equal to 0.85 upon fy okay so this is the condition which gives us the minimum area of steel to be provided in a flanged section okay so that's all there are uh, the, these are the conditions which govern uh, the determination of flanged width uh, in a uh, in a t section or an l section and also the minimum transfer minimum steel to be provided and the amount of transverse reinforcement that needs to be provided in the next video we will see the analysis of a flange section for under reinforced and balanced conditions.